Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello and welcome to Just Branding. Today we're honored to have Professor Jenny Romanuik as our guest. Jenny is a renowned expert in marketing and consumer behavior, and she serves as the Associate Director of the Ironberg Bass Institute for Marketing Science. She's a sought after speaker, consultant, scholar, and the author of several influential books, including Building Distinctive Brand Assets and How Brands Grow, Part 2, co-authored with marketing guru, Professor Byron Sharp. In this episode, we're going to dive into the fascinating world of branding, consumer behavior, and marketing effectiveness with a focus on distinctiveness, differentiation, and brand growth. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Jenny. Thank you. Great to be here. Just before we dive into the meaty stuff, can you just give a little bit of an introduction to who you are, where you came from, how you got here, uh, and anything else you'd like to share? I kind of got here by accident, a lot of different little accidents along the way. Um, Never planned to be a professor, never planned to be in marketing, and I originally got into a science degree because I didn't get into physiotherapy, which was my first option. So I got into science, but then I don't know what you do with a science degree. So I changed to occupational therapy, which I actually didn't really know what they did, but it sounded like physiotherapy. And I thought, well, I could always transfer. Um, And I, I, I knew somebody who was doing this thing called a business degree. And I went, I have no idea what that is, but I'd done economics and quite liked it. Um, so I went, oh, this business thing seems okay. I'll do that. But I don't read instructions. So I didn't read the thing that said you had to decide what your major was until I was in line and had to decide what my major was. So I had a whole, like, literally 20 seconds because it was only when the person in front of me was asked their major and gave a response. I'm like, what do? do? Um, they had to answer. And so uh, all that came out of my mouth was, uh, I'll, I'll do marketing. I hear they do that good here. And then um, I finished my degree and I went, I have no idea what I want to do with this. All I had this prevailing thought was I didn't want to spend the rest of my life caring about what dishwashing liquid people used. And then finally went, all right, I have to get a real job. Interviewed in a few places. And most of them went really not well. Um, and then um, there was an ad in the paper to do a master's by research. And I went, oh, okay, yep. Maybe I'll go and I interviewed with Byron um, and, um, yeah, they let me in. Just sorry to interrupt. When you say they, I I presume you're talking about the Ironbird Bass Institute? Well, at that stage, it was the Marketing Science Centre. We hadn't formed the institute yet. So it was a nascent research centre that was just starting up. Um, But they were willing to give me money to study and I went, I calculated I could move out of home. I was living at home, which was kind of doing my head in. Um, And so I went, yep, this will do. And then I finished my master's and I went, oh, I actually quite enjoyed that. So they said, do you want to stay and do a PhD? And I went, okay. Then I finished my PhD and I went, I quite enjoyed that. And so I was going to do a maths PhD, but then Byron convinced me to apply for a, a senior research fellow position, which I was kind of a bit iffy on. You know, I was like, I don't really want to be an academic. That wasn't my path. And then um, I went, oh, all right, all right, I'll do the senior research fellow. And then so, yeah, I became an academic and then just kind of slowly moved up um, through that, but never with any real great game plan in mind. Well, that's, that's kind of fascinating because if you connect the do- dots backwards, it's like, well, that's how you got there. You explored all these different things and you didn't know what to do. You're like, oh, dabble in this, mm-hmm. dabble in that. And it just the path kind of converged at some point. Once you got into that, uh, you know, the academic side of it, you pretty much stayed there the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. Now you you continued that. How how long have you been doing that now? I finished my PhD in two thousand. Um, so okay, so <laughs> a lot of experience. Twenty three years as an academic, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I I don't think of myself as an academic in the sense that I know people who their objective was I want to be a professor, and that's never been my objective. I'm glad I am. It's nice, but um, never was the objective. I'm, I just like solving problems and answering questions, and I'm just lucky enough to have a job that pays me to do that and people who stimulate me to you know, provide me with good questions when I can even come up, come up with them myself and the resources to, you know. Yep. Well, I have, a, I have a ton of good questions to ask you all about distinctiveness yeah. and differentiation and brand growth, uh, so we can get into that. I do want to 
uh, ask though, what's what? Uh, how would you describe the Ironberg Bass Institute for people that haven't heard of it before? Just like you have sort of, you know, big medical research centres that do things into, you know, cancer research or uh, vaccine research and things like that, we basically are a group of scientists working together to understand how marketing works. Um, and so we're predominantly funded by industry. Um, we have a range of corporate sponsors around the world. If you go onto the website, you can see the names of companies that support our work. Um, but yeah, it's 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 basically a, a lab for marketing research. Just a quick question on that. So you, you know, you mentioned you've got these corporate sponsors, and they obviously support you. How does it work? I'm just super interested at a high level. Like, how does it work um, in terms of the programs? that you select in order to research? Just, uh, you know, I don't know if you can give us a snapshot of, of how that might work. Basically, our uh, um, funding model for a corporate sponsorship perspective is a subscription model. They prov- they pay an annual fee. We have long-standing research programs. Um, so, and each of, and all of them have um, streams of research and multiple researchers coming in. So every year into the Institute, we have between six and 10 new researchers coming in who start on a journey in a particular one of those research streams and keep adding to it because nothing is usually answered by one project at one time. We're asking big, if you ask big questions, you need lots and lots of different ways to tackle it. Some things work better than others. Some things are start that then get built on more and more as time goes on. Some uh, have parallel streams um, where they do. So we have all of that. So Basically, our corporate sponsors buy into, they know what we're researching and they know that's what their money is going to. And we provide them with early access to the results. Um, They get FaceTime with the researchers to interact with them directly. And then we also do contracted research where we do projects in specific areas that are of expertise, like measuring distinctive assets, mental availability, category entry points, laws of growth, all of the things that we're known for, we actually do contracted research. We do that first for our corporate sponsors, but also for other organisations as well. And so that provides us with the funding that um, funds our data collection, our researchers, because they get paid, obviously, to work at the Institute. Um, Fortunately, we haven't got a model yet where people will just come do it for free. Um, And so... Um, yeah, so that's sort of how it comes in. So we get feedback from our corporate sponsors, uh, particularly about um, the topics and the questions they have, and that can directly, but often indirectly, fuels where we where we're looking to expand our research. Um, and we also have advisory boards, which are subsets of our sponsors, um, representatives that also advise us on how they're going, um, how they're going adopting our information and the challenges. So we are constantly interacting with, so we have one foot in industry dealing with marketers, their challenges, their things, and then the other foot is in the academic world trying to do good, strong, robust research that because we're a university research centre, we publish in academic forums as well. You come from a science, maths, kind of economics background, which is really uh, unusual for this show because we often talk about brand and we come from the emotional emotional side, mm-hmm. not like the marketing and science side of side. So we're excited to dive into this and so our listeners can hear a little bit more about the science behind brand. Let's just start at the top. Like, what is distinctiveness in the context? Like, why is it crucial for a brand success? Okay, so the way, but one of the easiest way I think to describe it is we all have a friend that has a style about them. You know, they have a look and feel where you could look at an outfit and go, yep, they would wear that, or that's that person's style of outfit. You know, even if they're not in it, if you just saw it on a thing, you'd go, oh, yeah, I could see so-and-so in that. You know, they just have a way of looking about them that makes it easily identifiable what sort of clothes they wear, what sort of hair cut they would have. You know, you could probably predict the sort of things they turn up um, and, you know, also when they would look a bit odd, if they were wearing something different out of that, you would go, you, you'd know immediately this is not your usual style. 
And it's not all of our friends, is it? Some friends turn up in anything, but there are just some people you know that just have a style about them. Well, that's what brands can be like as well, that this is just this characteristics, visual or audio. They can be other sensory as well, um, that just is, is what makes them look like them. Um, and that can be broken up into the different sorts of sensory components that um, contribute to that sense of, yeah, that's that brand and not anybody else. And that's really all distinctiveness is. Okay. And why is that crucial for brand success? Because we live, uh, we um, brands operate in very cluttered marketplaces where they need to stand out and be easily found and recognised. And those cluttered marketplaces are, um, well, those cluttered places are in advertising and media. So advertising and media is cluttered in the environment. So if you're talking about an online ad, there might be text, other images and stories around it. But also even within an ad, a brand has to compete with other stuff in the ad. It might be a celebrity, might be a cute dog, it might be some music or something like that, all of which can distract the viewer from the brand. And then when you go into sales environments, there's often other competitors around as well as the environment. So you walk through a supermarket, um, even before you've got, even if you're at standing at a shelf, there's a brand has to break through the physical clutter around them, people jostling, maybe kids are running around and the person's half eye looking at what's going on on the shelf and the other half trying to stop their kid from tearing down something over there or opening up a pack that they shouldn't. Um, they've got mental clutter because even someone who doesn't have someone with them is still thinking about their work day. Plus there's competitive clutter because there are other brands on that shelf that they've got to stand through. And so distinctiveness gives brands the power to be able to just stand out that little bit more and give it a mental advantage over um, what's going on in the environment. The simplest way is to say it's distinctiveness is about standing out. So what would be? It's, it's about standing out, but it's also about looking like you because you can stand out for all the wrong reasons. Okay. So your friend could turn up, um, you know, in a garbage bag. And, yeah, they'd stand out, but that wouldn't be them standing out. It'd be well, Matt in a pink suit, completely. for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there are some, yeah, some friends wear a pink suit would be perfectly normal for them to turn up in. So, so that's the yeah, thing. I may, I may. You may see me in a pink yeah. suit. The whole flamingo thing. He's yeah. got it going on. <laughs> hey, Barbie, Barbie. We were in the era of Barbie. Pink is in. Yeah, is is in. Yeah. Jacob was there first, I think, with his flamingo uh, color and everything. No, I even, I even dressed up as Ken back in 2014. <laughs> For Halloween, <laughs> and my wife was Barbie. <laughs> uh, brilliant, brilliant. I was just going to say, though, um, so distinctiveness, what we're saying then, uh, Jenny, is standing out for the right reasons, looking like you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've got about a shed load of questions about that definition or at least, you know, aspects of that, because how does a brand know, um, I guess it would be my first question, what what they should be like? Okay, so well, that's a choice that you that you make. So the thing about distinctive assets is, and that's the so distinctive assets is a word we give for the look of the components that make up um, the distinctiveness of a brand, breaking it down into actionable, measurable components. So they're things like colors, shapes, uh, words, um, images, um, like. Uh, um, audio sounds, um, all of these things can all contribute to the distinctiveness of a brand. So the thing about distinctiveness to remember is it's not innate. We didn't all wake up with some um, as a collective consciousness and go, wow, the swoosh means Nike. You know, that wasn't just a natural thing that we came to. We had no, We have no need to develop distinctive assets for brands. They'd actually talk to us through brand's actions over time. Um, so that means you have to make a bit of a conscious decision of what you want your distinctive assets to be. And so how you do that is um, a whole range of different questions. So first of all, the thing to remember with distinctive assets is there are tools that you work with. They're not the ends, they're not the goal. The goal is to be easily and identifiably found as your brand in, in in all sorts of environments. Distinctive assets are your toolkit to do that. So that means it depends on what your environments are. So if you never 
communicate in an audio environment, you probably don't need an audio um, asset then. That's not a tool that you're going to use. If you um, only ever, for some reason, do everything in black and white, then that's your colour. You don't need any other colours because sort of stuff. So you need the tools that are going to fit. So once you've decided what type of tool you want, you know, do you want a colour or a word that's going to work in the environments you're operating, then it's about the substance of it, which colour, which phrase, which symbol. That's a challenge of counter-programming because you want to be able to own it. So you can't have anything that evokes competitors. So we have two key metrics that identify if you've got a strong distinctive asset, and they're called fame and uniqueness. Um, uniqueness is I'll talk about first because that's about the degree to which you own the asset. If that asset is present and the brand is not there or not noticed, are you the only brand that comes to mind or do you share it with competitors? The more you share it with competitors, the more problematic it is because when you use it, you could potentially be marketing for your competitors. And then fame is how widespread that knowledge is. So how many people, when they see or experience that asset, um, think of your brand? And an, a strong asset has both fame and uniqueness. You're the only brand thought of it, and pretty much anybody who's in the category thinks of your brand. Those two metrics affect selection, but then they're also the vanguards of how you know when you've achieved a strong asset. So could you provide some examples of, you know, some strong, distinctive brand assets? Yeah, I can. Um, I thought about this a bit because I, often there's some examples, there's common examples that I bring out that, you know, everyone knows, but it, they usually um, have been around for so long, it, it can be a bit defeatist where you mm -hmm. go, Ah, oh, you know, unless you've been around for a hundred years, you can't have a strong distinctive asset. So there's a couple of newer ones out that I think are really quite cool and and in an unusual market. So um, I once did work for a financial institution that had a cartoonish character that was really well known, but they refused to use because they felt it wouldn't make them look like a serious financial institution. And the reason I'm saying that story is one of my favourite um, distinctive assets, new one distinctive assets, is Astro from Salesforce. Um, you know, it's a cute little character sort of stuff, but it just shows that, you know, a company like Salesforce, which is a very serious institution in terms of what it offers, can still temper that with a cartoonish tech character that is you know, really work really easy to communicate and share in, um, that, in that environment. Um, yeah, and it's on the back of others that have done that in those sorts of serious products like the Geico Gecko and, and things like that. Um, the other one I quite like that's relatively new, but an evolution of an old asset. It's one of my favourite assets used to be HSBC's red borders um, that they used around their ads. And the reason I liked it, it is that combination of, of colour and design because red is a relatively common colour in financial services. Lots of banks use it. But actually incorporating it with a board, as a border on their advertising meant their ads were easily identifiable as HSBC, even when you saw them in a long distance away. Um, and so that ability to get the brand across, even when someone can't even read the words on the ad, is a really powerful device. And, of course, as soon as I put that in the book, what did they do but abandon it? Um, and so <laughs> it's like, oh, great. So this is why I, I'm always cautious about praising distinctive assets because I'm a bit worried that someone's going, oh, right, well, we're going to get rid of that. Um, but I do notice that they've now evolved that border and incorporated in their hexagon design but using it as a border element. And I hope they persist with that because I think it's an evolution of the prior one, which I liked, but is something, again, that is ownable for them and has a lot of advantages in the spaces in which they particularly use, which tend to be things like, you know, air port um, as you walk onto a plane and things mm -hmm. on at an airport and stuff that you're seeing often at a big distance or in, in the distance away. 
So some other ones that come to mind for, for me at least, so Matt, you can probably share yours, you know, the Heinz uh, shape on the tomato sauce mm-hmm. bottle, yep. the Coca-Cola shape of the, the bottle, the red color, obviously mm-hmm. the swirl, the McDonald's arches, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the absolute vodka shape of the bottle. Like these are pretty mm-hmm. iconic uh, assets. But I'm curious, like, how can a brand measure, I know you use the uniqueness and fame, but is that just like a subjective tool? Like, how how do you actually measure that with, like, science, I guess? Yeah, well, so, yeah, I mean, we do it with a, it's a, a, a survey of consumers, uh, category buyers, and there's you can design questions that capture uniqueness and f- that allow you to extract uniqueness and fame metrics. And the key thing is to utilise it, to, to measure it in the way that reflects how the assets are going to be used. So, so we did some testing when we first started out of different approaches. Do you cue the brand or the asset? Do you do it prompted or unprompted? And what we found is the best way was actually to cue the asset. So you take all the branding off of it. All right, so if it's a Coca-Cola bottle, you would just have the silhouette of it. Um, and then you just put it there. You recruit people who buy. You give them a category frame, and you need to do that because otherwise it's too hard to extract from memory. If you just say what any brand that associates with this, particularly when you get to categories that are less well-known than soft drinks. Um, but then you just ask them which brands do they link to that and let them uh you type usually type it in um, because we don't provide names, um, and then you code it afterwards to work out. You know, and you give people the opportunity to have multiple options, um, so that you can capture if they're thinking of more than one brand when they see that. Um, and there are some structural things you have to put in to reduce things like inhibition and priming effects, where the response to one question affects the response to the next question. That's a challenge when you're doing things unprompted. But we found if you prompt for brands, uh, you got an inflated score and it was up to 20 percentage points, um, which means you will think your asset is stronger than what it really is. And that's actually quite dangerous if you're thinking of distinctive assets. It's much better to you know, underestimate its strength than it is to overestimate its strength if you're using it as a replacement for the brand. So, you know, so we our approach is deliberately hard because we think it should be a hard test if you're wanting to replace your perfectly good brand name with something else that's not the brand name, but you want to evoke the brand name. Okay. Nice. Um I've got a I've got a little follow-up question if I may. <clears throat> So you measure the distinctiveness, um, you know, based on audience response. I mean, there's a shed load of questions we c- I could ask you about that, but I just wanted to ask this simple one. I think, do you find, or or has it been found, and and this is a, a gen- genuine question. I'm really interested that the distinctive, the more distinctive the brand, the more you know recognized in the category, the more successful the brand in terms of revenue. Is there is there a correlation between? you know, mm-hmm. money making and distinctiveness? Not directly, because remember, this is a tool. It's not the destination. So the goal is excellent branding. And you can do that through distinctive assets. You can also do it through your brand name as well. And often when we, you know, one of the reasons that we started distinctive assets, because um so stepping back, we know how brands grow. There are two levers that marketers have, mental availability and physical availability. Mental availability is about being easily thought of in buying situations and physical availability is about being easy to find and buy. So dealing on the mental availability side, which is where I do a lot of my work, I would go, yep, okay, to build mental availability, you need good branding. And everyone would agree and nod and go, yep, yes, good branding, excellent branding. Of course, that's obvious. And then they would show me their good branded ad. And I would look at it and go, hmm, you know, it would have nothing in it and then this big branding splash at the end. And I'd be like, so what about this ad do you think makes it well branded? (laughs) And they would go, well, see, we've got the brand at the end there and we've done the pre-testing and everyone notices that brand at the end. And I'd be like, yeah, but in the real world, people don't sit and watch the whole thing. So that and realized that there was this whole conversation that had to be had about what constitutes good branding. 
And then in that conversation, is, there was a lot of pushback, particularly from a creative side of, well, we can't put the brand name everywhere. It's going to ruin our creative idea, you know, sort of stuff. And so distinctive assets are, are, are kind of a surreptitious way to get branding into creative um, so that the brand can stand out and compete more from there. To that end, it's a tool that you use to get good branding. Now, I don't care how you believe advertising works because there's not agreement on that, but the one is one thing that I've yet to have anyone disagree with me, and, you know, it still could happen, but that is that you have to know who it was who was advertising for it to work. So no matter how you believe it works, you still have to know the brand that was actually advertising for it to work. Um, and so that's where, where distinctive assets come in. They can more easily make it easier for the brand to know and potentially can allow more creative options. So if you think about M&Ms and their create, they have great creative, but they meld in their distinctive assets, their characters with that. And so that, that becomes a, um, a very strongly linked um relationship between the creative and the distinctive assets. If you take something like Geico, only about a third of their ads use the gecko. Um, and they suffer in branding when they don't use the gecko. Um, so you know so this is where these these things come into play. So there's not a direct relationship between distinctive assets and success. They're tools that help you build the things you need for success to build mental and then physical availability, which I haven't talked about, but that ability to stand out in shopping environments is absolutely vital because we know people are repertoire shoppers in most categories. They have multiple brands they could buy. If you don't stand out, if you're that little bit harder to find, you're not likely to be one of those that's um, chosen. So, so, so these are necessary but not sufficient conditions for success because you can have the best distinctive assets, but if you, say, have a poor portfolio, so you don't have the right products, so people are not going to buy you, if you're not distributed well, if you don't have presence and you're not easy to buy in some way, shape or form, um, so you're not in the supermarket where someone's there or um, in the online marketplace when someone's shopping there, then you still won't get bought despite your distinctive assets. So there's no – that simple correlation that strong distinctive assets equals success, it's – it's we don't have that and you're never going to get that because that's just not how marketing yeah. works. I think that's a fair point. It's it's too a simplistic way of looking at it. Yeah. Is that even a word? But it, but, but, it, but it also forgets that there are – yeah, we're always working through this lens of building mental and physical availability and distinctive assets are one way to brand – which is one part of how you build those two elements. So, you know, to find a direct relationship with everything else, you know, to be able to control everything else to make it equal, oh. to be able to clear that relationship, I would be, put it this way, if someone said to me they had found a direct relationship, I would really question the modelling that they had done because I'd be going either it's so experimental that we can't, that you it's, it's hard, it's difficult to generalise or you've missed something in it. It's, um, yeah, because you do see some correlation because bigger brands tend to have bigger budgets, so they mm -hmm. tend to be able to build assets more quickly because they have wider reach, can have wider reach in their marketing. But it's not a perfect correlation because bigger brands also have more people with fingers in the pie and makes it easier for them to lose the consistency um, that they need to keep building assets. So often they have quite messy big portfolios where there's those are they're not contributing to the overall distinctiveness of the brand. So bigger brands have the potential to have stronger distinctive assets, but often um, the marketing efforts basically they shoot themselves in the foot. Yeah, they dilute they dilute the, uh, the the distinctive nature of what they're doing. Particularly, I find this particularly across regions as well. Like it's very hard for brands when they go into a new a new a new kind of a whole new you know continent, for example, with different cultures, different 
ways of and then you've got different teams different communication methods so trying to just internally trying to communicate out and, and trying to manage that is a nightmare so you know you see that you see that happen quite a bit and yeah. i i was going to say i was going to throw jacob you said throw a few th- few into the mix so there's a there's a brand over here i don't know if you've heard of it it's called it's a uh, like an insurance compar- comparison uh, website and it, it's it took everybody by storm i don't know about 10 years ago it's called compare the yep. Have you seen that is that over in yeah, yeah, australia yeah. across yeah, the world yeah, yeah. You know, it's just that the, the the little meerkats they're just so powerful, right? And do you know how I do you know how they were where how that was that came about? Somebody the was idea. having a joke about a, a Russian accent or something. I heard in a yeah, pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just some creatives went to the pub after a few <laughs> beers. They realised if you said market with a Russian accent, it sounded like meerkat, and that's how Alexander <laughs> Belov so was born. Yeah, it's which so you know, I mean, a lot of people talk about. Oh, you have to have deep insights to come up with distinctive <laughs> accents. Well, no, Still you don't. Pub. The, the Geico uh-huh. Gecko came about because um, it was an, a campaign they were doing during the last actor's strike and they couldn't use any human talent. So they had to come up with a cartoon character and someone was supposed to go on Geico, Gecko, yeah, let's do a Gecko. And so that's how, so if you think about how these famous things came out, a lot of them were happy accidents. I think I think we're hearing everybody everybody who's creative uh, listening in is hearing permission to go to the pub. Go to that the pub. was just absolutely. Just yep. I, a couple of other ones that I really love, like uh, the ma- male chimp. That's quite a distinctive asset, mm-hmm. you know, the, the little chimp. Um, also, you talked about borders, and when you were talking about, it, I was thinking, oh, you know, the most famous border in, that comes to my mind as a distinctive asset is the National Geographic, mm-hmm. the yep. yellow yep. border <laughs> around their magazines, and then how they took. Mm-hmm. That concept throughout a lot of their comms, you know, genius. Yeah. I had one curveball, right, to throw at you, Jenny, because this is what we do on this show. You know, you, you know, Jacob's worried now. What the <laughs> heck is Matt going to say? What do you think, right, about the new Twitter uh, rebrand <laughs> by Mr. Musk of the black, uh, well, it's a white X on black, completely throwing all the distinctive equity that was in Twitter to one side, introducing something completely shocking and bizarre. And everyone's like, like, what is going on? I like one part of me likes to think he's an absolute mad genius and it will really pull it off. Another part of me thinks he's just ruining our profession. (laughs) But I I don't know. What are your thoughts, Jenny, on that? It just puzzles me because I think here's someone who paid $44 billion dollars for a company and he's so far decimated the product, gotten rid of the distinctive asset. I just wonder what he bought. Why didn't he just start from scratch? Because, you know, it it just seems to me a very expensive exercise of dismantling something that, yeah, I mean, I'm not a Twitter person. I've never been on Twitter. It always struck me as a hoi for people. You'll never get on it now because it's not called Twitter anymore. Yeah, I know, but that's the thing. I feel like I missed that uh, thing, but I didn't actually even that. But, you know, but the thing about it is, so so this is the interesting thing that just puzzles me is, you know, the people, because I've seen on um, LinkedIn people talking about, you know, he's a mad genius and just wait, you'll see, you'll prove you're wrong. But I just go, wow, this is a really expensive thing that he could have spent $44 billion just creating X, which is seems to be what he always wanted to do. So I don't know it just it just struck me as interesting. I, I I'm always sad when distinctive assets, for no reason of their own, get retired. And you know, there's there's a graveyard somewhere of distinctive assets that have had that over the years, where there's no real reason why they were stopped using. They just were. Um, so yeah. So you know. So so to me, I go. I understand why he might feel like he had. I just think that. It's just kind of like if this is where you were going, you kind of took a weird route to get there. And there's mm-hmm. probably other routes that could have, because he has such a strong following. If he had launched his own ex, those people would have come to him. Um, so so this is, yeah, I just find it a really puzzling decision from a business perspective of why you would go this route to create something new um, that even if it's successful, what he creates is new. Um, the path to get there has been one of destruction when it really didn't seem to need to be. 
He didn't have to destroy Twitter to create X, but that's what he seems to have wanted to do. Yeah. Maybe there's some agenda that's separate to what I don't claim to know. I like to think there is, Jenny. As I say, I worry that there isn't. But um, So in in terms of distinctiveness, though, you know, I look Mm -hmm. at that category of, say, social media as a category, and you look at, like, Instagram, TikTok, you know, uh, LinkedIn, and you know, Twitter was already relatively distinctive, right? In that in that yeah, section yeah, yeah, yeah. of the market, so it's it's strange. Um, and he, you know, to to put X in for my my personal view is it, it is quite distinctive, very unusual, very different jars, massively. Definitely, yeah, definitely cut a program to other um, what other brands look like. In, in that category, but the the, the challenge, the, I guess, the issue is, is as you said, is it showing up with the wrong clothes on, right? And is that going to have a detrimental effect for the wrong reasons? So well, I mean, thought- I mean, it depends on if you think of it as is this t- Twitter or is this something different. So if this is something different, then it's creating its own wardrobe, essentially, yeah. um, rather than it's the bird putting on a new outfit that doesn't quite suit it. So I mean, I think the bird is dead um so that's what i'm saying it's like it, it just seems weird that i i don't know it, it seems like he's trying to create something but i don't know why he had to destroy twitter to do it um mm-hmm. yeah it just it just seemed odd to me and i but from a i don't i'm not a designer so i don't comment from a design perspective from a distinctiveness perspective that's the challenge of and so there's separate brand name challenges which i understand there's few issues with copyright things like that that maybe um still need to be f- sorted out um and then there's the design of it and it depends on what else is going on with it um yeah yeah, yeah it's it's I said I I don't know enough to to kind of judge other than to sort of be a bit perplexed about um it seems like going the hard way to hard and expensive way to achieve something that was always going to be hard and expensive to achieve yeah yeah perplexed right, well, perplexed you're not the only one you're not the only one yeah <laughs> it's kind of like you decide to climb like Mount head, Everest. Yeah. you decide to climb Mount Everest and you give yourself an extra backpack full of bricks just for the hell of it. Mm. Mm. Climbing Mount Everest is hard enough. Don't need to make it harder for yourself. Yeah, that's 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 the comment I have. Well, Jenny, we've we've talked about distinctiveness. On the other side of the fence, uh, some say is dif- differentiation. You know, this is often mm-hmm. emphasised like a key strategy for brand success. Could you just share the, or explain the concept and how it differs from mm-hmm. distinctiveness? Yeah, so so differentiation comes from classic economic theory. That is this idea that in order for someone to buy a brand and keep buying a brand, they have to see some value in it that other brands don't provide. And that value can be something you have that is unique. So your brand offers something other brands do not, or you can offer it better than other brands. So, um, yeah, so they're the two routes to providing this value to consumers. And the idea is if you lock consumers in because you offer something other brands do not, then they will be disproportionate. They will stay with you longer. They will be disproportionately loyal and they'll be immune to what competitors are doing because you've locked in those people because you've got what they offer. So so that's the, so there's two elements to differentiation. Different from other brands and value, that that difference provides value. So so it's actually not about differentiation versus distinctiveness, even though I, I particularly recently the argument has become that. Hmm. It's actually about breaking differentiation down and saying those two elements have different roles to play. They don't have to be put together. So, for example, I can be different in a way that doesn't ostensibly offer value to people. I can have a different colour. So Coca-Cola is a different colour can to Pepsi. Yeah, would you agree with that? Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's different. They're not the same, they're different colours. But do you value the red of Coca-Cola versus the blue, red and white of Pepsi? 
No, you don't go, gee whiz, I really want a red soft drink today. I'm going for that Coke. Today I'm feeling a bit blue. I'm going to go for the blue one. No, but it is it is how they are different from each other. So that element is distinctiveness and that you choose your distinctiveness because you do want it to stand out from other brands um, and you want to be able to own it. You want to own that so that you don't inadvertently market to competitors. But then there's the value proposition because brands have a reason for being. There is a reason why you buy Coke. In fact, there are many reasons why you buy Coke. And this is what we call category entry points. So these are things like you might refreshing, you might want something to wake you up, you might want something to go into the movies with, to go with your popcorn. Uh, you might want something to mix with a scotch at the end of the day. You know, there's all of these different reasons why you come into the category so differentiation would say you need to offer that more or better than competitors um, and so you have to be the best coke to mix with a scotch or the have a unique taste that it's the only thing that goes well with popcorn you know you have to do something that's better or different or unique or superior to others Whereas when we talk about mental availability, we say, no, we know that there are multiple soft drinks you can have with um, mix with, with mixed with scotch or have with your popcorn or will refresh you on a hot day or wake you up. What I'm battling for is to be salient in your mind so that when you think I want something refreshment, you think Coke. And then that gives you a better chance of choosing a Coke. Now, not every time you'll choose a Coke, because sometimes you might think Coke and Sprite and Seven Up and you uh, on Fanta, and you might go, "Oh, today I feel a bit like Fanta. I feel like something orangey. I'll go for that." I haven't had that for a while. All these things can go into that go between thinking of it and choice. But the idea is that you want to be known for it. You want to have fresh networks for it. You don't have to be better or superior to be chosen. And we know this because big brands tend to not be better or superior on the things they offer to the category. They're just more widely known. So are you saying differentiation is about being better or? Uh, yeah, that's it. Or unique. Yeah, that's By the definition. value in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, I noticed there's been some efforts to recast the definition. Um, that's like me saying, well, I don't like cooked vegetables, so I'm going to change the definition of health to not include cooked vegetables. It doesn't work that way, does it? There's a definition of health that includes foods that are healthier and foods that are less healthy. Um, just because my personal preference of things doesn't mean I can't change it. But that is the classic definition of it. It has two components. You need to be better or unique to offer something other brands do not or better, and that thing has to be of value to buyers. Could you share some examples of some successful brands that are differentiated, I guess? Yeah. I mean, the thing about differentiation and one of the reasons is that it's often linked to innovation, but then there's the sustainability aspect of it. So often when an innovation is successful, so during a time when a brand launches an innovation, like Nespresso, when they launched their pods, there was a short period of time where they were the only one in the market with these pods, um, and that was differentiation. But what's happened to that market now? Saturation. Of other pods. Yeah, there's lots of other pods. There's lots of people who offer Nespresso compatible pods. So you don't even have a lock-in in the type of pods that they produce. There's that, and that's normally what happens in competitive markets. So, yes, for a brief period of time, they were differentiated. They were the only ones who offered the, the pods. But over time, competitors copy and it comes in. Now, when you get genuine differentiation, it's usually when there's a patent involved. So Viagra, when that was launched, that was genuine differentiation. They had a patent for it. They were the only ones who could produce it. They were offering value that other brands do not. And so they reaped the financial benefits of that until the patent expires or someone else comes up with a similar 
solution in using a different formula, et cetera, because that's the nature of technology. But there is a period of time when, you, so if you've got a patent, you can do that. Um, Tesla's another example of in the period of time when electric car technology was new, they had superior technology and so were able to corner that market. Um, that's an interesting conversation because I've heard a lot of people go, oh, they don't advertise. And it's, you know, so they succeeded without advertising. It's like, no, they succeeded because they had more demand than supply. If you have more demand than supply, you don't need to advertise. But what's happening to the electric car market now? A lot more competition coming in. What is Tesla saying? We will be advertising. Of course they will, because they'll be competing in a market with everybody else. And the innovation playing field will be equal until someone makes the next step in there. So differentiation can exist. It's often not sustainable, whereas distinctive assets, the reason why they often contrast is distinctive assets, you do them right, they can last forever. You know, they will outlast us. And you think about some of the ones we know now for brands that have had long legacies. You know, how long has that crowd, has um, Heinz had that label? How long has Coca-Cola had that bottle shape? Um, even Nike and that swoosh, you know, that will outlast all of us. But the technology Nike uses in its shoes that won't because that will continually evolve and then will be copied by competitors. Sometimes Nike will copy technology from other competitors to keep up in the marketplace as well. And so that's the nature of how that works. Um, yeah. Okay. So how important would you say differentiation is and innovation as well, right? If you're just going to be copied in X amount of years. It's important because that's how the category evolves. Just think where we would be now if we all were only drinking instant coffee. It'd be a sadder place, wouldn't it? Oh, I mean, maybe yeah. Starbucks would be happier. But, you know, I like the fact that I could have a decent coffee in my house. As soon as I finish this, I don't have to go out to a coffee shop, wait for someone to make it and sort of stuff. So this is about evolution in, in a category and everyone should be innovating to do that. Um, but reality is if you're good, even if you're not good, I've seen innovations be copied. Even the bad ones tend to be copied just in case they might be successful. Um, some One of my colleagues, um, Dr. Kirsten uh, Victory, she does a lot of work in the innovation space, looking at failures and how that works and sort of thing. And, you know, you see things that, you know, you wonder how anyone thought this was going to succeed, not succeeding, but still people will copy it. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's important to innovate. And if, when you do it successfully, you will for a period of time have a differentiation advantage, but it just won't stay there for the long term. So so it's interesting to hear to hear to hear that to hear that put out, you know, like that. I often think about it. I work a lot in B2B. Mm -hmm. And what I find fascinating, and this question always comes up, is, you know, a new CEO comes in or a new leadership team, you know, mm -hmm. takes, takes the boardroom by storm. And, of course, they want to signal to the world that, that things are different and, gonna, and are going to change. And they have a new strategy and a new commercial plan and, you know, all this stuff. And the next thing that usually happens is they think, right, we're going to rebrand as in mm -hmm. the identity of the business, in order to signal to the market that, hey, we're different now. Yep. So what, what I always think is an interesting conversation is, is like, well, okay, but um, if we throw everything out, aka Elon Musk, um, you know, is that actually going to serve our longer term interests mm -hmm. uh, better because we become less uh, recognizable in the market? Um, and then you play that off strategically because – there might the answer sometimes comes back. Well, yeah, it is better because we we want to disown some of the stuff we've been doing. We want to become known to to go into the future as something different, right? And you know that's great. So uh, that is always a very interesting tension there. Uh, I find in terms of in terms of the on, on the distinctive side, where I find people really struggle, you know, and, and businesses at least I work with in B two B is in that kind of. Uh, differentiation sort of space because it's kind of like okay um you know are you uh, i always like ask well where are we different like in, in you know is it in how we do it is it in what we offer is it in is it in the the experience that we create is it in, you know what is it where are we different and if there is no nowhere that we're really different i know that business has to go to work because otherwise it can't just rely 
on its on its reputation long term because as you say competitors are going to come in so i love the way that that both of those tensions kind of come to play what are your thoughts on the idea though of 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 what i've just said about businesses sort of rebranding to signal the new do you think that does them longer term harm i mean i guess in 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 consumer goods it does because you know at the point of buying somebody now doesn't recognize the product that they used to purchase all the time but in b2b do you think it's less of a less of an issue out of interest from the research or i don't know if you do no. research well there was a there was a lot in that oh i'm sorry <laughs> let, me yeah, let, me let me break it let me break it down into a couple of points so the first yeah. thing is um re changing distinctive assets to signal we're improving, we're on the up, we're changing, et cetera. Um, that's a classic case of often solving the wrong problem. It usually wasn't your distinctive assets that caused you the problem and why the old CEO got fired and the new one is in, um, if that's the case. So, uh, why there's a feel this need to rejuvenate, usually there's a problem. Uh, solve the problem. Don't blame your distinctive assets for it because chances are you'll just be exacerbating the problem because they might have been the one thing that were working for you. Um, the other thing I'll say at the risk of sounding a bit pretentious, but I love the quote from Thoreau, which is um, uh, beware of activities that only require new clothes and not the new wearer of clothes. Um, and um, yes, um, it's probably got it slightly wrong, but this idea that it's just if it's just window dressing you're doing and not actually changing the fundamentals. Um, what's the point? Um, they're going down to the question. So, so what you're grappling with, and this is the challenge that I think marketers need to get their heads around, is that it seems, and this there's this feeling that buyers can't choose unless they've got a reason. Okay that I have to give people a reason to buy. Um, just like, you know, when I chose my partner, I had a reason why this is the person I love and why I didn't marry any of these other people that I probably could have married, but I didn't. There's a reason why I chose this particular person. Brands aren't like that. Brands aren't commitments for life. They're often simple transitory things that we want to get to us. We don't we have many ways that we can solve something. And often the thing will be, I chose that one because it was on the shelf I could reach. It was three steps instead of five steps away from where I was. We can make these decisions based on quite trivial things. I don't need a deep, heartfelt reason to choose everything I buy. Even things like I bought an electric bike, I just chose based on a little bit of information. I went, yeah, that will do. And that was, you know, over $1,000 uh, in there. But I wanted an electric bike. Which of those electric bikes I had was less of an issue. They were all pretty good brands through a reputable retailer. I knew if I had a problem with any of them, I could take it back, you know. Those sorts of things were less of a concern. I actually was just a bit disappointed I couldn't choose the bright colour that I wanted because there was a purple one, a blue one, and I ended up with a rather austere, bluey-grey colour um, sort of stuff. So so this is where we, we, we often think that, but we actually don't. In the moment we will often make decisions based on things like physical availability, not just what we know about the brands. So, so when the CEO comes in, so often the question is, how are we differentiated? When the question actually should be, because that is a proxy for what is the reason why people buy us, when actually it should be, what is the re why do people buy us? And the answer is typically because we offer a range of things that are suitable in the category and they know that, you know, this is the different needs that people come into the category for and we cover really well five out of eight and the other three we're, you know, working on. But there are also other brands that also do that and just sometimes we just get lucky. Um, and, you know, B2B, you think about why do people choose that? Often people think there's a more detailed involved process. No, B2B are people too with the same brains, the same imperfect information, the same time pressures on having to make a decision. 
you know, I have three data collection suppliers that I choose when we do research. And sometimes my decision will be, I haven't used them for a while. Sure, I'll go for them for a quote. I'd like to mm. think every single time I make a concerted of who is best for what. But the reality is there's a lot of my studies where they're all equally fine and they'll all get me a good sample in a timely manner in the way that I want. And so, you know, it's just part of me having a repertoire is risk mitigation um, that I spread it out so that I'm not reliant on anyone. So so, so, so often, you know, we kind of think that there's a has to be a deep-seated reason for making a choice. No, there doesn't. Never has been, um, never will be. Now, we will remember those occasions when there are, and there are sometimes really good reasons for choosing something. But those reasons can be, but are still going to be based often on imperfect information. And if you really pushed and researched all the brands in the category, you'd probably find, you know, five others that could have done the job perfectly well. You just didn't realize it at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're talking about consumer behavior and how they make decisions. So what power as marketers or branders do we have to actually put, like, I guess, point them in a direction that we can mm -hmm make them buy like what what power do we have we're always it's, think of it as a probability game rather than a certainty game you know we're always up in the odds so the more you can increase mental availability the more you um so if you think about people's brains and people don't want to think about a category until they actually have to buy it you know we don't sit here i don't sit here daydreaming about soft drinks when i'm not thirsty um i don't sit here and you know think yeah you know, most categories we don't think about them a few sometimes maybe we might like um, when we've got particular passions for it so i love travel so yeah i do think about travel outside of actually traveling but usually i'm thinking about where am i going to travel next and i've already started that process um so a lot of the role of the things we do in marketing is encouraging people to think about the category and our brand outside of that purchase cycle to give us a slight advantage next time someone comes into the category. Okay? So that's the thing. And then once they're in there and they've we've given ourselves that mental advantage, then we want to make sure the environment is set up to make it easy for them to act on that. We don't put any road bumps in the way by not being where they're buying, by not having the right um, you know, shape or the right size or the right features on a product compared to you know what they're looking for um that they don't you know it's easy to grab them they're not in a sea of sameness you know these are all things that can create barriers to people purchasing and we want to make sure that that is as frictionless as possible once we've created that mental advantage but it's always ever going to be just a probability game upping those odds okay but if we're increasing the mental availability the more we increase it, the better the odds, right? So is it about being yeah. the noisiest or like what what methods can we use? Oh, it's about that? reach brand reach branding and building useful mental structures. So reach is about trying to get to as many category buyers as possible. So rather than me constantly going to you, back to you over and over again, I want to make sure I'm widening my things in a time period so that, I'm trying to hit as many different because I can only affect the brains I reach. But I still need to have good branding in there because you have to know it was me that was throwing. So think of reach as um, I'm throwing a ball in your direction and you have noticed it and gone, oh, there is a ball. And yeah. So then you look and you go, who threw that ball? And you want to know it's me. That's the branding aspect of it. So yeah, that ball came from Jenny. Cool. And you've remembered Oh, that's right, Jenny. She throws balls at me. Um, and then next time, um, and then it's about, well, then you need to know when you, then I need to communicate to you when I might want you to think of me again. So that's about building re well, memory structures, but those memory structures should be things you're going to use when you're entering into a category and you're working within a category. So they shouldn't be about me. They should be about you. Jenny, mm. she's a great podcast guest. We should have her again, sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, whereas if you're thinking about, um, oh, Jenny, she wore a nice top that day, that's not going to help me next time you're thinking of podcast guests next year. Where you, whereas if you think, oh, yeah, uh, there's things. She said some smart stuff. 
or she made us laugh or whatever, you know. So so that's about, it's a really bad analogy, but it is the morning and I've only had two coffees. So. <laughs> no worries. No, no, I totally get it. So, Jenny, I was just going to ask, like, how often are you going to throw this ball then? That's the next question. So it's about reach. Yeah. But you can. yeah. Many times you can, but spread out. So there's been lots of research showing that um, you do better to enhance memory when you have spaced out exposures rather than more crammed together. So so if I reminded you I exist tomorrow, the day after and the day after that, you'd be like, oh, yeah, her again. She was, I'm going to, you know, send her to send her to junk. Whereas if I, you know, in three months' time went, honey, it was a great podcast, how's everything going? And then in three months' time, after that, did it, distributing it out. Each time you'd go, oh, that was nice to hear from her again. And advertising is like that. When we see it in close succession, our brain just switches off. Even if we don't actually get over it, um, our brain just naturally goes familiar stimuli, recently seen, not worth my attention, um, and so downplays it is. Okay. Um, so that's the thing, and, and that will vary with budgets, which is why I was talking about why bigger brands with bigger budgets have an advantage in this because they can reach many more people. Smaller brands with smaller budgets need to get smarter about how they do their marketing and make sure that they're not wasting it by hitting the same people multiple times in quick succession. Okay. And does it matter where this it's happening, right, like how often? So let's say like you're doing a, you know, a digital like online, for example, versus a printout or whatever it is? Um, no, I mean, different media have different ability to cut through, but no, it's about going where your audience is and trying to maximise that. And often a mix is the best way to make sure you get reach because you're reaching people in different medium and if they're different people or at different times, uh, that's opportunity. That's the kind of the challenge of media with so much fragmented media is how do you achieve reach and minimal duplication? Um, but, yeah, it's it's that's the difficulty in the online environment is everything is so fragmented. It's hard to get a consumer or category biocentric view of how your reach is going. Okay. All right. So we've talked about distinctiveness and differentiation uh, the last thing I want to tackle is, you know, brand growth. You've written a book on how brands grow in part two uh, with Professor Brian Sharp. So as a professor, a research professor, what would you say are the key principles or strategies that truly drive a brand's growth? Yeah, well, mental and physical availability, um, being easily thought of and being easy to buy, they seem to be the two big levers. And underneath that is a lot to happen. Um, it's about um, think of it more like a, a systems-based approach rather than um, a pick-your-winner approach because under mental availability we have reach, branding, and building useful mental structures and under physical availability, we have presence, prominence, and portfolio. And each of those has to work because if one of them doesn't work, all of the others don't work nearly as well. So you can't go, well, I'm doing everything right, but my branding is rubbish because if your branding's not rubbish, you're not going to effectively build the mental structures that you need. And so you're not going to build the mental availability, even if you've got the reach right. And even if the message you are trying to build is a useful one, you're just not going to do that well, which then is not going to make your, your physical availability be disadvantaged because you haven't built the mental availability. But similarly, say you do a great job of building mental availability, but you can't get distribution it's going to be difficult to buy and therefore you're not going to reap the rewards of successful mental availability building. So it's all about working all of these different things and then keeping them up and keeping them better, um, keeping them as best as they can given advances in technology, you know, so the fact that we have different media coming out, so you've got to experiment and work out, is this good for me to use? The fact that we have different channels now, you know, when is it a good time to take on a new sales channel? Because that's a big commitment to take. You know, you don't want to be too early because then you can be easily diverting resources and over-investing in something, as in maybe most, a lot of brands that rush to the metaverse might have found out. 
Um, but you don't want to be too late either because then you miss the boat if you're, you know, not being able to work effectively in an online supermarket as a packaged goods brand right now. Um, you're losing sales because that's a competitive playing field and where there is increases. There's still more grocery shopping happening offline, but that's still a growth area. So actually working out um, those sorts of things and keeping every all of those six elements up to date, that's a really important and big challenge. We're learning a lot about how marketing works, and that's a really exciting time. So, you know, um, understand that however you think marketing might work now, um, you're probably wrong in a lot of things, but that's okay. That's the nascent of nature of being in a new science. We've only been doing serious marketing research for, well, less than 100 years, essentially, since about the 1950s, um, in a rapidly changing world. So, you know, so don't be afraid to challenge your own assumptions, ask for evidence and look for evidence. You know, don't take anything just because um, some famous person or some consultant says it. You know, it's actually about going, what is the evidence for this? Um, we're trying to do our bit to put evidence out there into the world um, and make it transparent how we came to the conclusions. And we're trying to encourage everyone to do the same. So, you know, so, so don't be afraid to um, challenge your own assumptions on how marketing works because you end up stronger as a result of it and better as a result of it. Lovely closing words. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, and last question, where can people connect with you? LinkedIn is the best way for me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So, uh, yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Or follow, I, you can follow me and if, if you're connected in some way, connect with me. But, um, yeah, no, that's the best way to reach me. Jenny, it's been an absolute honour. It really has having you on the show. Uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And, uh, yeah. I, I love the way you just dropped the mic at the end there about uh, the challenge of how marketing works. I found your your book very challenging. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me.